On the back cover of Raising Capital for Real Estate, I wrote that raising money is the single most lucrative and sought after skill in the entire real estate sector, and I stand by those words. However, if you do not know how to underwrite deals effectively, you will find yourself working for years for free. And that's not what we want to do. That's not what I want for you listening to this show. I want to avoid that as much as possible. Also, if you're a passive investor, underwriting is really important because not only do you need to know how to do it yourself, you need to know how to look at an underwriting model and see if the operator you're investing with is putting themselves in a position to deliver for you as an investor. You need to be able to see behind the kimono so you can actually understand if the operator is taking the underwriting process seriously. So today, we're going to talk all about underwriting, and we have a great guest to do so. One of the reasons I say that is our guest recently launched a book, and I'm very happy with the way it turned out. I got a sneak peek. I got to read the book before it was launched. I even gave the author a quote because I really enjoyed it. The book is called The Definitive Guide to Underwriting Multifamily Acquisitions. And believe me, if you liked the way that Raising Capital for Real Estate was written in the sense that it was a no-nonsense approach, that's the way that this book is written as well. It's very detail-oriented, very to the point, but it's like, listen, here's the information. If you actually want to learn, this is what you need. Now, if you're just trying to waste everyone's time, then maybe it's not the book for you. But if you actually want to understand how underwriting is done at the institutional or quasi-institutional level, this is an excellent, excellent resource. And we'll link to that in the show notes page. Again, the definitive guide to underwriting multifamily acquisitions. In this interview today, our guest uses a term I don't frequently use. It's really, really important. I use kind of a metaphor for the term execution risk. This is a really important term to understand. It's very difficult to underwrite execution risk, but it's critical to understand that risk if you're going to assess an investment on a risk-adjusted basis. Now, I use the term implementation risk or business plan implementation. So really important concept, especially in the realm of discussing underwriting. We're going to talk about how our guest accounts for and underwrites reserves in today's climate. Sounds like it's not an interesting discussion on that particular topic, but trust me, it is, especially when you're dealing with COVID concerns and how to really overcome those concerns. Also, the lending environment is changing and the reserves and those requirements are changing similarly. Now, lastly, as passive investors, we need to be able to look at someone else's underwriting model and understand it. So we have a conversation about that as well. Now, in previous episodes, you've heard me talk about the mentorship program, a cool bonus to the program is that every six months, even after you're done with the program, every six months, you get invited to the CFC Mentorship Program alumni webinars. And these are webinars where we have speakers. Sometimes they've been guests in the program, sometimes they haven't. They come on the webinar and they talk about a very detail-oriented topic and give away a lot of secrets that are not really best communicated via audio. So it's things like, hey, here's a really important strategy and structure that we did for a note that requires some explanation. We had Matthew Owens come on and talk about notes and investing in IRAs and doing things like wraps, very complicated topics that you need to listen to and listen to the recording of and go through and watch how he's actually doing it. We had Neil Bawa present on COVID-19 right as it was kind of becoming something that was in the mainstream media. Neil Bawa came on and gave an excellent, very detailed, very data-driven presentation at one of these CFC mentorship program webinars. And the next one we're going to do is the author of this book, the guest of this particular show, is going to show us his underwriting model, and he's going to walk us through each line item in Excel as we kind of watch over his shoulder as he underwrites a particular deal and walks through the underwriting model and tweaks different things. And we can see how different tweaks make an impact on the overall return profile. That is very, very powerful. That's not available in audio only because it doesn't really make sense to do so. But for these previous students or current students of the mentorship program, they get access to something like this every six months. And again, it's free for life once you're through the program. So if you want to check out that, go to cfcmentorshipprogram.com, apply now. We are currently taking students for Q3. And again, like I said, once you're in the program, you get access to these biannual webinar series, which I have learned so much during those calls. So again, cfcmentorshipprogram.com, click apply now, and I will see you on the inside. Hope you enjoyed the episode. 
How's it going, everyone? Our guest for today is Rob Beardsley, who oversees acquisitions and capital markets for Lone Star Capital. Rob has identified, negotiated, and structured over $100 million of multifamily real estate transactions, and he's also evaluated thousands of opportunities using his proprietary underwriting models. Rob has a popular newsletter run by hundreds of real estate professionals and has published over 50 articles about underwriting, deal structures, and capital markets. He also helps run Green Oaks Capital, which is his family's real estate investment and advisory firm. Rob, so good to have you. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks for having me on. So I have done a ton of public speaking engagements about two things, raising capital and due diligence. And I haven't really touched a ton on the asset management side of things, and I also haven't touched a ton on the underwriting side of things. And so I'm really looking forward to this conversation because I think that underwriting is kind of in conjunction with due diligence, but it's not exactly the same. Like underwriting, actually looking at the models is such an important part because if you don't have a true understanding of the sensitivity of the deal on a line-by-line basis, you're going to get into some major problems. It doesn't matter how good the market is, for example. So first of all, tell us a little about your background and then also how you got started down the the path of really focusing on underwriting is what you're bringing to the business. Absolutely. So I really grew up in a real estate family. So I was around it all my life and really took that for granted. I didn't realize how much I knew about real estate until I actually started getting the business and talking about it and applying it. I kind of soaked up a lot through osmosis. Both of my uh, parents ran a brokerage from home. So I just heard them on the phone all day long, talk deals and be a part of their business. And then most famously, my parents tell me that, you know, when I was in diapers, I was on their construction sites. So I've been around it my whole life, but my journey took a little bit of a turn because they actually, growing up in Silicon Valley, they wanted me to be in tech. Their dream for me was to be Mark Zuckerberg and, and start, start a startup, take a public cash out. And that was the, the norm for where I'm from. So that's what they were pushing me towards. And I went along with it, went to school for computer science, was studying computer science, was learning how to code, but really was in love with investing. And real estate was a very logical place to begin my investing career. And I started applying a little bit what I was learning in computer science in terms of just thinking analytically, thinking programmatically to the real estate business. And that's kind of what pushed me into the underwriting space of building models, looking at things through, through the numbers and, and that whole angle. And when it comes to actually using Excel, well, actually, first of all, is that the program that you use? Yeah. Okay. And where did you start to get those real Excel chops? Good question. So I worked for, as a data analyst for a e-commerce department of a retail company in New York City. And that was really where I got my Excel chops and learned a lot of fun stuff and really was opened up to the world of, you know, using Excel with, without touching the mouse and that kind of stuff. I'm back to just basic Excel on my Mac. So it's, you don't need the full capacity of all that, but that's really where I learned how to uh, put it all together. Makes sense. And that program is so robust and crazy and it's even gotten more robust and more involved and even used in its most simplistic form is, is pretty incredible and powerful. Let's talk about this topic today, which is underwriting. Why is this important? Why should people that maybe aren't even active owners still pay attention to this concept? And for those who are active owners, why is underwriting such an important part of the entire investment model? Yeah, so underwriting really is the basis of your investment. So it's the way of translating all quantitative and qualitative assumptions about your investment into numbers. So when I say quantitative, that's pretty straightforward. That would be something like cap rates and rents. And then when I say qualitative, it's indirect assumptions that may not be directly inputted into your model, but nonetheless, you're making assumptions and you're making observations such as median household income and the schools that are nearby and um, the job drivers. So taking those components and converting them if they need to be converted into really the numbers and then plugging that all in. And that really just determines whether your investment has a strong basis, whether it has merit and should be move forward with or should be backed out of. And I think it's equally as important as a passive investor as well as an active investor. It may even be more important as a passive investor because that's one of your few tools that you have in the toolkit to really evaluate your opportunities that are in front of you. Obviously, if you just take 
And even as an active investor and you're dealing with brokers looking to buy property directly, every broker is going to tell you that it's a 20 IRR and all their pro formas look the same. And similarly, as a passive investor, every sponsor or syndicator has the same pro forma. It's always a 20 IRR and it always looks the same. And so on both sides, you have to be able to sift through that and really figure out what works for you. Makes sense. Let's talk about kind of the stages of this underwriting process, even before the project is really far down the line in terms of going under contract, for example. What are some of the steps you need to take to ensure that the project is well positioned to produce outsized returns? And then how do you go about establishing each one of those metrics? Yeah, that's a good question. So starting from a process standpoint, from the very beginning of every deal, we'll always perform a preliminary underwriting. And we try to do 10 to 20 of those per week. So we're always in the market, always evaluating opportunities, and we're seeing what relative returns are. So by underwriting so many opportunities, especially in targeted geographies, we get a better sense of where deals are pricing and where they're trading and what assumptions other buyers must be making in order to make their deal pencil. Because we're all out in the market solving for similar return metrics, right? We all want a 15% IRR and we all want you know, a 7 8% cash on cash. So that means other buyers in the market are making certain assumptions to make those numbers work. So our preliminary model will kind of inform us generally of, of what that is. And then moving forward, we'll need to perform more extensive comparables analysis, such as I think rent comps are one of the most important things to do in your underwriting process, because especially if you're pursuing a value add, that your, your whole deal is relying upon being able to achieve those rent premiums. So rent comps are super important. And then the sales comps are kind of like a sanity check because obviously you you want to see that your sales price makes sense for when you're selling as well as that your going in basis makes sense. And that can be different depending on the deal. And then you also asked about metrics that we we're looking for. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of them, but I kind of said the the main ones that everybody talks about, IRR and cash on cash. So depending on the risk profile of the deal, obviously you're ASIM capital, very risk-adjusted thought process. So are we, I think, the lower the risk of the deal, the lower return we're willing to accept. And I think risk can be defined as, in, in terms of numbers, and quite simply, how much are you changing the current numbers as they are? If I'm going to buy a property and not do anything to it, I'd consider that to be low risk. But if I can look at my underwriting model and say, wow, I'm actually growing revenue by 20%, and that's built into my assumptions due to my renovation plan. I'd say, okay, well, there's some execution risk. That's a little bit higher risk. I want to be compensated for that. Similarly, if I'm buying a high vacancy property and I'm planning to lease up, that's another risk. So we're looking to be compensated for those risks. So I'd say our IRR is anywhere from 15% to 22% project level IRR. And then cash on cash can be anywhere from really on a, on a five-year average getting up to, to 9%. Makes sense. You mentioned sales comps, and I want to circle back on that because I think there's a lot of confusion about this. When it comes to sales comps, how are you pulling that? And because a lot of these transactions are private, where do you go to get that information? Yeah, definitely. They're much more opaque or difficult to obtain than rent comps. And we typically, while we utilize Yardi, CoStar, those can be helpful for sales comps, but we are often in Texas, which is a non-disclosure state. So We don't have direct sales data that is available in the public, but loan data is available. So you can impute sales values through loan data, but that can also just throw you off a bit just because leverage isn't consistent. You can't assume every single loan is at 75% loan to value. So that brings me to my point of the number one way to get sales comps is leveraging your broker relationships. And you know that's what brokers get paid to do. And they're really the the conduits of information. So they all keep great sales comps records. And so we, from time to time, reach out, especially if we're working on a particular deal, we'll just ask for sales comps that are related to a specific area or deal. Yeah, that's actually a really good answer. And I think that it is important to accept when you use the word opaque. I think that's a really appropriate descriptor because we can't rely on these as if they are just a statement of fact. It's sometimes word of mouth. It's sometimes an assumption. It's sometimes an estimated average based on that loan data, which I think is a great takeaway. And I think really importantly, when you look at sales data based on cap rates, for example, it's very challenging because NOI for sure 
is not publicly available. I mean, brokers most likely won't even know anything about the true NOI of a building because that information is just not readily accessible and it's not disclosed. So I just wanted to mention that. But having said all that, it's important to validate your underwriting assumptions through those mechanisms and tools and relationships that you've developed. That's why those relationships are so important because you can't just Google them. Is that a fair summary? Absolutely. And I think you brought up cap rates, which are obviously really important to understand. And it's helpful to have cap rate data along with your sales comps. Uh, But the problem is a cap rate is not a cap rate. When you're reporting a cap rate for a sale, it could be what the seller's cap rate was, which is basically pre-tax adjustment and, and however they were choosing to run the property. And, and the, or you could have the buyer's cap rate. And so there's a lot of gray area there as well in the cap rate, but it is still important to have that knowledge. And again, that's the value of underwriting so many deals and being in the market is you can take this data as relative data rather than just see the average cap rate of the trades as 5% and say, okay, well, it's a five cap. You can actually relate that to, well, I've actually underwritten a handful of these deals and I know that those deals traded at X cap rate. And so you can generally say, well, it seems like CoStar or or whoever's providing me this data is off by 50 bips or 100 bips on their cap rate, which I will say CoStar to me, at least lately, has shown higher cap rates than what I believe are truly in the market. And that's a function, I think, of them using the seller's cap rate, which is higher, and us using a more conservative cap rate formula, which creates about 100 basis point difference in which our cap rate is lower. Okay, so that is a really good point. And I have a million different questions to ask you on a variety of different topics. But before we move on, I have to kind of circle about this because I have presented many times regarding cap rates and everyone's definition of a cap rate. Everyone knows the definition of a cap rate until you actually ask them to define it. What I mean by that is NOI divided by purchase price. But there's a lot of different variances in terms of how you can get that NOI. So walk us through how you guys define cap rate and how you underwrite a true cap rate and what could potentially be responsible for that 100 basis point variance, which is quite significant. Very significant. Yeah. So we'll speak specifically about going in cap rate. So the purpose of a cap rate, before we define it, the purpose of a cap rate is to really understand the income potential per dollar of what you're buying. And so what that means is I don't care how the current owner of the property is operating their property from an expense perspective in terms of calculating my cap rate. Because maybe if they are a mom and pop owner that self-manages and manages with really cheap expenses, I can't do that the same way. And my expenses will be higher and my cap rate will therefore be lower. And so I can't just calculate my cap rate using their expenses. So what I'll define now is what I call an adjusted going in cap rate. And the way we adjust our cap rates is we'll take the trailing three or trailing 12 true revenue. So we're not going to tweak with revenue. Revenue is pretty, it is what it is, but expenses are the, are the, the gray area in the pro forma. So what we'll take is we'll take the seller's true revenue numbers, and then we'll layer in our expenses that we believe to be representative of not only what we can perform at, but what the general market would underwrite to. And then we also include replacement reserves, which are anywhere from 250 to $350 per unit per year in a replacement reserve, which is usually mandated by the lender to reserve up on a monthly basis. And so that's money that we assume will be spent over the lifetime of the deal. And it's a monthly cash outflow. So we just write it off as an expense included above the line, and then that calculates our NOI. Additionally, we will factor in our our future property taxes. And so this is another huge thing that some people may consider, may not consider. And there's a lot of nuance there, but that's your 100 basis points spread right there between seller and buyer. Because oftentimes on these transactions, property taxes could be jumping from 200,000 per year to 300,000 per year. And that could completely change your perspective of how much income potential the property has on a going in basis. Okay. Excellent answer. And I'm going to restate it just to confirm that listeners are tracking along and to confirm that I heard you correctly. So With your firm, the way that a cap rate is calculated is the trailing three financials on normalized expenses multiplied by four. That's the way that NOI is calculated. And then dividing that by the purchase price. And then, of course, including in the the taxes as well as the reserves. Is that fair? That is fair. Okay, cool. So that's not how everyone does it. And that is a good practice, what you just said. That will give you a very conservative cap rate 
But when you see a cap rate in a deal, I'm talking to you, passive investors, if you see a cap rate in a deal, it isn't necessarily the case that they use the same formula. They could use the future three months multiplied by four. They could not include the reserves. They could not include the tax. They could also use the future 12 months divided by four. All of those things would be reasonable in terms of the way that we originally defined cap rate as being a NOI divided by the purchase price, but those changes can make a big difference. And if we're talking about the difference between 100 basis points, meaning a six cap versus a five cap, that is going from being like, holy crap, I got to call everyone I know. I found this deal that's crazy to this is a market transaction or a below market transaction. So I know that we just did 20 minutes on what a cap rate is, but I'm sure that some of the listeners are actually really grateful because this actually matters at the um, competitive elite institutional level. Now, Let's move on from cap rate to get into some of these other metrics because they're all important. And the cap rate is obviously critical, but there's many, many other ways that things can go wrong if you're not looking at the actual details. So let's talk about this. First of all, when you go to look at a deal, you mentioned reserves, for example. That also is a function of the lender requirements, but different investment theses require different reserves. What are your thoughts on reserves from a big picture perspective? And how do you adjust this based on the level of business plan implementation risk that each respective investment requires. Yeah, so you nailed it right there. So we have some typical rules of thumb in terms of how much capital we want to have reserved up in our personal owner account, Or right? We will have a number of bank accounts for each property, an operating account, an owner account, and potentially a CapEx account. And so lender may have their own reserves and that's very deal dependent. We can go into that. But for a start, we have a our rule of thumb, which would be something around one to two months worth of total expenses, including debt service. And that'll give us a pretty good general rule of thumb. And so the one to two months, the way we determine if it's one, two months, or potentially even three months is, like you said, depending on the execution risk of the deal. So if we are going in with a bridge loan and we have a a business plan of raising rents and leasing up the property and spending a lot of CapEx, we may want to have additional reserves in case we have higher vacancy for longer than we expected or other unforeseen circumstances. So that's our general rule of thumb for reserves in terms of that that we reserve up. And then there are a couple other reserves that you mentioned, such as interest reserves that would be held by the lender, replacement reserves, which are escrowed on a monthly basis by the lender to make recurring capital expenditures. So all these things and your CapEx budget, which may be held by the lender, all should be taken into account together. So for example, if your business plan is to raise really no CapEx money upfront, you have no delineated capital expenditure plan from the start, you should definitely budget and anticipate a lot more recurring CapEx through the ownership of the of the property. So however, if you plan to spend 2 million bucks on exterior improvements and interior renovations, that $300 per unit per year that's going to be reserved up by the lender, you may not even touch or need for the first two, three years of ownership because you're so busy spending money out of your defined budget. But then once that runs out, you may start drawing from that big reserve that you've uh, accumulated over the years. So all these things need to be factored in together. But uh, what I would say, just generally speaking, we all tend to underestimate recurring CapEx. We all just factor in what our expenses are and that's our NOI, and that's our cash flow. But really, there's usually more expenses that happen below the line. There are partnership expenses, and then there are unanticipated capital expenditures. So I think it is good to be reserved for that, whether you choose to reserve for it upfront or factor into your model on an annual basis that you will spend a defined amount on CapEx. For example, if the lender is reserving up $250 per year, you can anticipate that being all spent. And then another let's say $200 per unit per year to be spent below the line. Yeah, really good point. And I think not only is it that you're kind of compartmentalizing these in two different ways, I think one of the reasons that you can actually get a lot out of rehabbing a property significantly upfront is that the actual things you're investing in are newer and therefore less likely to require maintenance as quickly. So you start to see where an investment in the early days can pay dividends for the entire duration of the hold period, as opposed to going in, having a property that is not in the best shape, and you're trying to basically nickel and dime your way through the hold period, you can actually spend more money 
and not get the highest return on investment because you're not actually adding value to the asset. So I think it's um, something interesting to play with. By the way, if you're not aware of this going in, you could say, oh, wow, this is going to be a much better deal if we don't make that investment. But the difference is you're going to make it. Trust me, you're going to make it one way or the other. So it's just a matter of when you do it and how significant the value add is going to be. So really important stuff there. Something that I have contemplated on the show and talked a lot about is the debt component, how important the debt piece is. Walk us through some of the underwriting assumptions when it comes to the debt and what investors need to be paying attention to when it comes to that part of the capital stack. Sure. And this is definitely a your mileage may vary situation. Some people prefer lower leverage, some people prefer higher leverage. And that just depends on on your risk tolerance and, and what your investment thesis is. But as an investor evaluating debt, I think it's a very difficult situation because the simple stuff to evaluate is all right in front of you. For example, debt service coverage ratio, I think is a, is a really big one. And it's a simple calculation of your NOI divided by your amortized debt service. So this is just a quick note, so I don't want to spend too much more time, but amortized debt service means principal and interest. A lot of people, when they're calculating their, let's say, going in DSCR or their year one DSCR, it'll be just based on interest coverage ratio because a lot of loans have an interest-only component for the first year or up to you know five years of the full term. But nonetheless, no matter what the interest-only component of your loan looks like, you always need to calculate DSCR on an amortized basis. So that's a quick thing there. But in terms of uh, some really important things to look at that are a little bit deeper than DSCR, because if you don't look at deals all the time, a 1.25 DSCR may not mean much to you. But something that is, I think, paints a very clear picture is performing a exit test or a refinance test. And that is simply looking at the loan term and forecasting cash flows out to the loan's maturity and then making certain assumptions at the loan's maturity about valuations, interest rates, and certain underwriting parameters, and seeing what a new loan would look like at that point in time. And that's really going to define your maturity risk or your balloon risk. And so when the loan is due and you have to pay it back, what does the world look like in terms of your ability to sell the property and pay off the note or better refi the loan into a new one and hopefully have cash out and not cash in because then at that point you're going to have to make a capital call and that's typically not a a fun situation. So I think that is one of the most instructive ways to look at the risk of a loan. And so obviously the shorter maturity will put more stress on the refi test because if you forecast out a 10-year maturity, things generally speaking are going to be better in 10 years than they are today, right? Rents will grow you know, things will just improve. You're paying over time. your debt down. Exactly. You're paying your debt down. So, really, this refi exit test is a hugely important test when you're taking on bridge loans or loans that are shorter in maturity than five years. So, uh, I, I may not even look at it when we're looking at a, a permanent financing deal, but when we're pursuing a, a deal that has a bridge loan, I model this, I stress test this all day, and I focus on it very heavily. So, that's, that's one. And then the other one is your break even. And we look at break-even occupancy based on your month one. You know, what's my basically going in break-even occupancy to pay my current debt? And then what's my occupancy that I need to maintain in order to meet my minimum DSCR? So typically, lenders want to see a minimum debt service coverage ratio of 1.25, which means your NOI is 125% of your debt service. And so we look at what is the occupancy we need to maintain in order to keep at that minimum. And then we look at that through month one, year one, year two, to just see, well, can this property withstand a 10%, 20%, 30% reduction in occupancy? Makes sense. And if you can, and you're in a market that's growing and robust and diversified, the likelihood that you will experience that reduction in NOI is limited. And so a lot of your investment thesis sometimes is focused on ensuring that that likelihood is significantly limited or eliminated. So for example, one of the reasons that I and Rob and a lot of people in the industry really like to invest in properties that are 100 units or more is that if you have a property that's 94% occupied, in order to experience a 21% reduction or 25% reduction in NOI, you would have to have a a terribly significant reduction in rents, which historically speaking doesn't typically happen, or a, you know, 25 people need to move out, basically. And 
This is very different if you have one tenant, for example. If that one tenant moves out, you can go from a totally fine debt service coverage ratio to a really challenged debt service coverage ratio. So different ways of mitigating that, everything from the actual municipality that you're in to the geographic risks associated with that in terms of natural disasters to the property itself in terms of things like visibility and the number of units. So we've talked about a lot of these topics, but I think when it comes to underwriting, that's when it all starts to tie together really nicely. So speaking of kind of the physical property itself, let's talk about the unit mix, for example. Let's talk about some of the things related to the actual tangible asset. Yeah. So the unit mix, for people who don't know, really shows a summary of the different unit types at the property. And this is true for any asset class, but for example, for a multifamily property that's pretty standard, you might have 50 one-bedroom, one-bath units, 50 two-bedroom, one-bath units, and 50 two-bedroom, two-bath units. And that would be your, your unit mix, and it would give you an understanding of your concentrations in, in unit types. And I think this is something that some people are aware of, but maybe less focused on. Uh, but I think looking at where the demand is and, and who you're trying to attract is hugely important in the way it relates to your unit mix. For example, if you have top-notch schools in, uh, in, the, in the school district of where the property lo- is located, you're absolutely going to want two bedrooms, three bedrooms, larger floor plans to accommodate the families that are seeking those schools. So if you have that deal that looks really good in that really great school district, but it's all really small one bedrooms, I think it still could be a good deal, but you're going to have to factor that in appropriately. So, and and then other ways that that can affect your calculus is smaller units should result in lower price per unit. And smaller units also will typically result in higher price per square foot or higher rents per square foot. So you need to adjust your rent comps or your just your comparables based on those making those adjustments. Okay, I may have gotten confused there. Smaller units should result in lower price per unit, but higher price per foot. Got it. Yeah. Right, because there's less bedrooms, so there's less tenants, and therefore, yeah, I totally understand. I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss here. Um, okay, yeah, I think that that's important. How do you talk about visibility in terms of things like daily traveled vehicles when it comes to the physical asset. Is that something that you're tracking as well? Not terribly. It's something if it's presented to us, we'll look at it, but it's not something that we focus a whole ton about. CoStar has that information, but it's not something that we really factor into our underwriting. What I will say is we're definitely focused on drive-by traffic and just based on the property's location, really irrespective of how many cars drive by, because it's hard. You really need to know a market as to, if I told you 20,000 vehicles per day, is that a good thing or a bad thing? In certain neighborhoods, that could be terrific. And in others, that could just not be sufficient. So I think the location really speaks for itself. So if we uh, we recently looked at a property that was really tucked in, in the back of a single family community, there's no drive-by traffic on this property whatsoever. So with that understanding, we had to factor in a substantially larger marketing budget in order to compensate for this. And I think on the flip side, if you have a a property that's located right there on a thoroughfare, gets a ton of drive-by traffic, and you've interviewed the the manager on site, and she says that all the traffic that comes in the door and new leases are all just through word of mouth and drive-by, well, then you know that your marketing budget can be trimmed down a bit there. Really good point. I feel like daily traveled vehicles, for example, are absolutely critical when it comes to something like retail, where multifamily is not as critical. And... Still, the presence of the asset is very important, but the presence of the asset sometimes is not met by just people driving by and saying, oh, wow, I need a place to live. You can see how the difference there with retail is like, oh, wow, I should go over there and buy something as opposed to I forgot I should be getting an apartment. Not super common in the multifamily sector. Let's talk about buying from different types of sellers. What are some of the mistakes that mom and pop owners may be making where you can see a clear vision to value creation versus some very experienced operators and how they can also make mistakes. Yeah. So it's all about the expenses. And there are some things on on the revenue side, such as rubs that we could talk about as well. But on the expense side, if you see abnormally low payroll, that's that's typically going to reflect more of a, a mom and pop situation or just somebody who is self-managing and 
it's definitely not a bad thing. It's actually something very enviable because they're running the property at a, at a nine cap while you're trying to make sense of it at a five. So they're doing something right. But when you see really low payroll, you're typically going to see also cheaper repairs and maintenance. And um, I would say those are the two biggest things that are controllable expenses that have the biggest impact on NOI. And so I think if you're inexperienced when you're looking at deals, you could just simply say, well, I'm just going to assume whatever the seller was operating the property at, and that those will be my expenses also. And that just couldn't be further from the truth. And that could be a good thing or a bad thing, right? If there's bloated expenses, once you get experienced enough, you'll get the confidence to underwrite to lower expenses. If you see somebody operating with abnormally high payroll and you know the market and you know you yourself have a property management company or you partner with one, you can have that confidence to underwrite to the lower payroll number or the lower repairs and maintenance number, depending on your CapEx plan. I'd say another place are utilities. So properties that have been owned for a long time and they haven't been renovated in a long time likely have inefficiencies in the utilities. We recently bought a few properties and within the first few months, we were able to get a 20% reduction in the utility bill simply by identifying leaks, fixing them, and we'll probably get an even an additional 20% savings in utilities after we've completed our programmatic renovation of replacing toilets to the low flows, shower heads, faucets, and things like that. So that's the low-hanging fruit that you don't see all the time, but those are certain ways that you could get comfortable actually underwriting to lower expenses. Yeah, I really like that. And I think you hit it on the head regarding your comments about buying from inexperienced owners, you know, if it's a single property owner, for example, and they're self-managing and they have a 38% operating expense ratio, it's important that you don't just say, okay, as a blanket statement, this is unrealistic and just move on. It's important to look on a line by line basis because what could be happening is, yeah, sure, they're saving these $60,000 a year that they're not paying the manager, but maybe the utilities are inflated. And that's why, you know, we mentioned Excel. Imagine this being an Excel underwriting model. Every single underwriting model should be taken into consideration. And like the gold standard is if you not only have the confidence in your assumptions, but actually have experience, especially if it's in the market, especially if it's in within a five mile radius, that's when you really start to have market advantage. And so I know that you focus a lot on Texas. I'm sure that you're starting to look at a lot of the same deals and seeing the same properties come up. And you know, look, if this property is the same year, same vintage, same size, and is operating at a, let's say, 48% operating expense ratio, there's no reason this property right down the street, same year, same size, should be operating at a 62% operating expense ratio. Now, the magic and the science of underwriting is figuring out which one of those different metrics can be adjusted in your favor. And I think the word confidence is really important because... It's so interesting. Let's say you have purchased 10 properties. You have $50 million or $200 million under management, and you're buying a property from a $10 billion REIT, and they're operating this property at a 60% operating expense ratio, which can happen. Inexperienced operators tend to under-report or underpay for a lot of expenses because they're nickeling and diming. Very large $10 billion REITs because they're well-funded and they're not necessarily paying attention to every single line item, may overpay. But if you're just a $100 million operator and you're buying from this $10 billion REIT, you've got to think to yourself, how is it the case that they're doing this and I think I can do a better job? Well, it comes with experience, especially if it comes with property-specific experience. Has that been your experience as well? Yeah, that's very true. And sometimes you'll see if a property has been purchased a long time ago, so they own it for a very cheap basis, and the debt on it is very low balance as well. There's just not a lot of incentive to perform. They can, they can run it expensively or inefficiently and still hit their returns. And so exactly. that's just one of the many reasons why you want to pursue acquisitions from longtime owners. And that's something that's been very rare since so many deals have turned over even once, twice, or three times mm-hmm. over the last cycle. But uh, yeah, we were recently fortunate enough to buy a property that was owned for over 15 years. And you know, we don't even know the stuff that we're going to figure out that we can add value to the property just yet. Yeah, you just know there's money on the table. Let's talk about rubs real quick. What does that stand for? And how do you think about this topic when it comes to underwriting? Yeah, so rubs are ratio utility billing system. And it's the way for your property to bill back 
for utility costs. And you can do this at a, you know, technically this isn't even rubs, but you could bill back at a fixed rate. You can just say, well, for one bedrooms, water is $20. For two bedrooms, water is $30, et cetera. Or you could actually run a formula based on usage. And so you could calculate the property's total, let's say water and sewer bill, and then you can divvy that up amongst the units based on metrics that you yourself can create for the units, such as the number of bedrooms, number of occupants, and and I put together a formula. And there are some laws, and I'm sure they're different everywhere, but from what I understand in, in most of the markets we're in, there's laws such as if there's no irrigation system, then you can bill back up to 95% of your utility bill. And if there is an irrigation, then you can bill back up to 90. So obviously you don't want to underwrite to billing back 100% because it's just not legal, not possible. So that's just the general rule of thumb. But typically in terms of looking at a lot of people will say, well, it's it's an easy business plan. I've got a property that's all bills paid, meaning there's no bill back to the residents for utilities. And I'm just going to convert it to rubs, keep the rents the same, and then pocket an extra $100 a month in, in basically additional rent. But that typically just doesn't come for free and isn't as easy as it sounds. So, And I think this is a, a huge component of the rent comps, going back to how we we're talking mm. about mm-hmm. rent comps are super important. There is sometimes, if on the surface, especially when you're dealing with all bills paid properties in a market of rubs properties, you have an uphill battle proving the rent upside because now you have to do all this homework into showing that that you actually can can either do one of two things, raise rents, make them look even higher than they already do in comparison to the market because they include all bills paid or transition the property to rubs. And so that is something you need to do a lot of homework on. And even Yardi and CoStar do not have this rubs data. There are other services like ALN, which does have rubs data, but the best way to do it that we found is just calling the properties directly. So we'll call comps and just say, hey, I'm interested in a one bedroom. Can you tell me a little bit about what the typical expenses I would be incurring above and beyond just the base rent? And then they'll tell you, well, you know, we actually charge back for water, which is typically going to be $40. And your electricity, you have to go work that out with the city. That's going to be about $50 and things like that. So we calculate that all, put that all together so that we can truly compare properties apples to apples. Yeah, really like that. And for the listeners, that is what's going on at the institutional, quasi-institutional level. Just getting as much information as you possibly can, taking nothing for granted and actually diving into the details because these little, very seemingly insignificant changes to an underwriting model may produce an outstandingly significant impact on the overall return profile of the deal. So it's important that you take that part seriously. Um, I do have one COVID question. We've been able to go through this whole interview without talking about COVID, but before we do, there's no moment in the underwriting process that's more significant in terms of that little number producing a wildly different return when it comes to exit cap. Let's talk about the exit cap that you're currently underwriting to, your thoughts on expansions versus contraction and how you kind of anticipate things going over in a five, seven, and 10-year period. Yeah. So it's been refreshing. We haven't talked about COVID once, but it's definitely something that's right in front of us and should be factored into your underwriting. I hesitate to kind of let loose and go crazy in terms of altering every single assumption. And basically, let's say you underwrote a deal three months ago and now it's back on the market or you're you're looking at it again, pre-COVID versus post-COVID. I hesitate to encourage just saying every assumption must be thrown out. You have to recalculate your rent comps. You have to recalculate everything. I I don't agree with that. And just for simplicity's sake, I would rather not do that. So for me, I've looked at the situation and really have narrowed it down to three metrics. And those are your going in vacancy, your stabilization timeline, and your rent growth. So something that that we do that's actually, we did this pre-COVID and it's just something more common is we typically don't have any rent growth embedded into our underwriting until we've stabilized the property. So which is usually in 18 to 24 months. And so now the way we're adjusting our underwriting is we are actually pushing out our stabilization timeline, pushing out our hold period. So maybe that's number four, but increasing our hold period, let's say if we're typically a five-year hold, now we're pushing it out to seven uh, to account for just the additional time needed to kind of work out the kinks. And maybe because the value add opportunity is potentially off the table today, it's available in two years, we'll hang in there and wait And as you know, extending your hold period will typically reduce your IRR because you're spreading that pop in value over a longer period of time 
which just reduces your IRR. So if we're keeping our IRR metrics the same and just increase the whole period, already we're demanding more out of the deal. So looking at the deal, we're probably underwriting to a 24-month stabilization period. In that time, we are having 0% rent growth. And then from there on, we're probably growing rents at 2%, which is our base case assumption. And additionally, we're going to stress our going in vacancy. I mean, we don't think the world's going to end. We just think right now might be a little more challenging than normal. So what we'll do is we'll stress our going in vacancy, even if the property's at 95% occupancy today, we'll probably underwrite to a 7, 8, 10% going in vacancy, which will linearly trend up to our stabilized assumption over that 24 month period. And I didn't, I managed to, to go through all that without talking about your question, exit cap rate. <laughs> so that would be number five, exit cap rate. The reason why I didn't talk about it is because we're really keeping it the same. My exit cap rate is something that I'm making a prediction about in the future, which is going to be typically three, five, seven, ten 10 years out. And I truly don't think that COVID today is going to affect the markets in five or 10 years. So, and similarly, if we still have less than favorable market dynamics in five years, then I will just not sell at that time and at that worst cap rate. I'll just wait until the year seven or until year 10 when cap rates are bananas again and I can sell at a four and a half cap. How are you? underwriting exit cap at this point, regardless of COVID. Right. So just our general guideline for exit cap rate is we just take our general market understanding for what a stabilized asset should trade in the market. And we're adding typically 50 to 100 bips over. And so the nuance there is I didn't say I'm taking my going in cap rate and adding 50 to 100 bips. I'm taking in the market cap rate because going in cap rates can be heavily skewed based on your business plan, the embedded growth assumptions, which the market is putting onto the property. If everybody in the market knows that you can raise rents $100 on the property, it'll trade at a lower than market cap rate. So rather than focusing on something that's more noisy or manipulatable, such as the going in cap rate, we just look at the market. And so particularly if I'm buying a value add deal, but selling a stabilized deal, I shouldn't look at comparable value add trades. I shouldn't say, well, look at all these 1980s properties being sold for five caps. Well, they all have purported value add. And when I'm selling my renovated property, it most likely will not be advertised as a value add. Now, you could be surprised because brokers have a way of <laughs> calling everything value add. And uh, that's great as a seller. But we certainly, we, we typically don't factor that into our underwriting. In some situations, we'll look at a deal and say, we will be in a position to sell it as a value add because let's say we didn't renovate it and then we will have a little bit of a lower cap rate. But in general, we're looking at the market for what that property is and then raising it by 50 to 100 bips. Yeah, really great point. I'd say that to put that in a very concise manner, if you were buying an asset that was 50% vacant, the cap rate could be a one cap or a no cap. And the cap rate, therefore, is not a very telling metric. If that zero cap is factored into your calculation of what a cap rate should be in a market, you're going to get a very skewed version of what true cap rates are. So just wanted to say that in a way that make the example really, really apparent. Rob, we have covered a ton of ground, everything from acquisitions and due diligence up front to working our way through asset management to now exit caps. You added a ton of value and I'm very excited for the launch of your book, we're going to link to that in the show notes page. It is launching on May 21st, which means you have done a tremendous amount of work up until this point. It's called The Definitive Guide to Underwriting Multifamily Acquisitions. Let the listeners know, you know just a little bit about the book and also how they can get a hold of it. Yeah, so the book is a hopefully more concise version of today's rambling. And it has a couple sections. One section of a full how-to, every single input in my personal underwriting model that I use every day. I like my model for many reasons, but one of them is that it's simple and yet robust enough that we can trust it and actually make investment decisions based on it. So because of its simplicity, it, I actually can, in the, the book, I can walk through every single input that you'll encounter and what to input, how to input, how to do your homework there. And then once I've taken you through that process of actually plugging in the numbers, then I take you through the next process of, well, how do you fact check these numbers using rent comps, sales comps, the refi exit test we talked about, your break even occupancy, and then rolling that into your deal and then saying, how do I take this and analyze the partnership structure? And I can actually factor into my underwriting model a waterfall 
which will take into account the partnership terms of such as acquisition fees, asset management fees, the preferred returns, the, the different hurdles and promote structures. So really arms you with the full toolkit to be able to understand a real estate partnership from top down. And um, what was the other question? How they can learn more about, you know, first of all, getting the book, but also, you know, I think that you had a, a giveaway on your website. I want you to be able to link to that as well. Right. Yeah. So this book is available on Amazon. We'll have it linked in the show notes. And also I encourage you to head to our website, lonestarcapgroup.com. And there you'll be able to click on the link at the top to get a copy of my underwriting model that I use every day for free. So you can follow along as you read the book and you know, play with the play with the model yourself. I'm gonna say stop what you're doing, go to the website, download. He literally wrote the book about underwriting and the model is available for free. It's incredibly valuable. And trust me, I read the book before it was available and gave Rob a quote about it. The reason I did is that it's written in the manner that anyone that liked my book, Raising Capital for Real Estate, will like this book. It's a great supplement because it's about a different part of the business, but it's a very detailed, no-nonsense approach to underwriting. And I think you did a great job, buddy. Really happy for you. Really happy to see um, that you've completed it and also very much looking forward to the reviews. It's going to help a lot of people. So Rob, man, thank you so much, buddy. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And I uh, really appreciate you having me on the show. All right, listeners, thanks for checking out the episode. As always, the contact information for our guest will be available in the show notes page, which is hosted on SoundCloud, iTunes, and Stitcher. Don't forget, if you want access to some of the free goodies that I'm talking about at the beginning of these episodes, like free eBooks, weekly investor emails, and articles about some of the most important investment-related topics, make sure that you have created an account with CFC because this stuff is automatically available. You can do this by going to cashflowconnections.com and signing up as an accredited investor. Of course, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hunterthompson at cashflowconnections.com. Thanks again. 